Welcome back, New York Suns fans. You're joined by Brennan and my co-host Nick as we interview a very special guest, uh, Stu Schwartz, a better known as Stuntman Stu. So let's bring him in now. How are you doing today, Stu? Come on, boys. How are you? How's it going? Excellent. Good, good. Uh, are you watching any hockey uh, today or the past few days since hockey's been back? How how, uh, how have you I been watched, feeling? I uh, watched the games back to back this weekend. <laughs> Friday night with my son and Saturday night with my son. Yeah. That, uh, no, how, uh, what do you, what do you think? How did the boys look after two games? I thought they looked great. I, I didn't think they would win uh, on Saturday. I thought it'd be tight. I told my son they'll probably maybe squeak by three to two. I was right for the wrong team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a bit, yeah. uh, Bit rough, yeah, I know it was. Um, it was a good game though, and I mean, at least uh, Timmy Timmy scored his first, and and that that goal. I was saying, Nick, um, my girlfriend was saying to me, she's like, I don't understand why you're so happy. Your team just lost, and I was like, What well, did you see, did you yeah. see Tim? Yeah. Right? <laughs> it was uh, it was all he needed. So, um, Great goal too. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely a memorable one. Um, it, you got to have a bit of skill, I think, to pull something like that off. Totally. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I actually wanted to kick off the interview. Um, I, I've got a, I've got a quick question for you. So I'm just wondering, um, how the nickname stuntman Stu came to be. Um, and I was wondering if you do do your own stunts. I'm sure you've heard that question a few too many times, but, um, regardless, uh, I was wondering if we could hear the heritage story of this. All right. Uh, Brennan and Nick, how old are you guys? <laughs> I'm 20. Old, old enough. <laughs> 20, I'm 26. So. <laughs> so way back, way back in 1996, Whoa. doing stunts for a radio station called 106.9 The Bear. And my first ever stunt that morning was doing a kind of a gorilla stunt, uh, stunt against another radio station. Anyways, I came back to the station and Doc and Woody, the host, were like, that was awesome. You were so good out there this morning. You pissed off the competition great stuff but you need a nickname you need a handle you can't be Stu the college kid <laughs> i was going to talk in college so they passed around a bunch of names there was superman Stu, studley Stu, and then doc said how about stuntman Stu?" and i looked at doc and i said doc that is the stupidest thing i've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> so you went with it <laughs> and i'll pay the mortgage yeah there you go <laughs> naturally that's, that's awesome i love that um so you know, obviously you're, you're very well known. I mean, you've been in on the radio for some time and actually I remember 106.9, the bear, it's too bad. They, they, they closed that down. Cause that was one of my go-to, uh, cause of my parents, but, um, you were also well known as the sense PA announcers. So while we're touching on your past, I just love to hear the whole process in becoming the sense PA announcer and how that was like for you. So early in uh, 1999, I was approached to be the public address announcer for the Ottawa Rebel Lacrosse because I had a good friend of mine that was on the, the promo team. She's like, do you want to be the PA announcer? I know you like that stuff. I'm like, absolutely. So I did the perfect face for it. Totally. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I mean, we could get away with murder. Yeah, we, <laughs> we were getting pumped by the Toronto Rock one game it was like 15 to two. So I announced yeah. finally on the 15th goal, I'm like, uh, Toronto Rock goal scored by, does it really matter? <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the in the stands. And then the owner of the uh, Rebel Lacrosse, Brad Waters, brought the Ottawa Renegades to town. And so they offered me the job as public address announcer. I had no idea what I was doing. I had uh, two old spotters that would, that would save me every game. And then in 2000, summer of 2006, a buddy of mine said to me, hey, have you seen the Senator's website? Now, I remember in 2006, websites were not where they are today. So they had a posting for the public address announcer's job. And I said, I'm going to send in an audition. So it was shit. <laughs> it was absolute crap. So I sent in an, an MP3. Little, lo and behold, I get a call like the next day from Glenn Gower, the director of game day uh, operations, who's now a city councillor. He's like, I'm, I'd like you to come in for an audition. So I went into the rink on a July day in 2006. It was just a dark arena. It was just Glenn and I up in the press box and he started feeding me numbers and getting me to announce goals. I said, can I do them the way I want? He's like, yeah, show me what you got. So I just started doing it. And then um, a week later, I got another call. And this time, unbeknownst to me, a dark arena again, it was Cyril Leader and Roy Malacker sitting in the stands listening to me. 
And then after about 20 minutes, they brought me down to Roy's office and Roy said to me, now look, I know you're a fucking Habs fan. So if you get this job, trying to get get too excited with a half score. You got it? Go <laughs> <laughs> Roy. <laughs> oh, there it is. so you uh, had to contain the excitement with the Habs came to town. I love, I love that uh, authenticity, though. Like that's so great. You're like, look, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it the way that that I know how to do it. Well, I spent years mimicking the public address announcer for the Habs, Claude, the late Claude Mouton. So I would go to school the next day in grade four, La Troisième Étoile, third star. <laughs> and actually, one of my first games, I did that. When Mike Fisher was the third star, I announced it. That wasn't me to the third star. And the <laughs> me. He's like, are you doing your Habs invitation? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's, That's funny. Fantastic. Fantastic. So did you become a Sense fan from that day forward? Is that the, the setting point, to, you know, cheering for the Sense? Well, I actually became a Sense fan about, uh, um, what was it, uh, six years before in 96, when I was working for the Bear, we had an event at uh, Marshy's at the Corral Center at that time. And I, I I went to the Corral Center. I walked in to Marshy's wearing my Habs jersey. And Marshy, oh. a big guy, stops and is like, you're not coming in here with that. I'm like, I'm some man Stu from the Bear. I'm supposed to be. He goes, I don't care. Go to the sens- Sensations at that time and go get yourself a Sense jersey. So <laughs> I, sensations. I get a jersey, the black one that I, I posted on uh, Instagram the other day. And uh, I walked back in. I paid like 200 bucks for this jersey because I wanted the one with the fighting strap. I walked back into Marshy's. Marshy's looks at me and says, I was just messing with you, kid. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> way. So it, it, it's all good. It's all good. That's, anyway. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, after that point, uh, you, you already spent too much money to turn your back, right? You kind of had to had to stick with them. Um, that's awesome. So I guess um, th- to follow up on that, um, following the sense for as long as you have, um, I- I'm wondering if there was one or two games or moments um, when you were working or, or maybe even just as a fan um, where you still look back in time and kind of just uh, think like, wow, that, that was truly special, like whether you had a part in it or just being able to witness it. Well, you know, just being able to announce, you know, the Stanley Cup final game three and game four was a was a, a moment I'll never forget. And the game three one, you know, there's parts of the game that forever are lost in my my chemo and radiation brain. But the one thing I remember the most was uh, just before I started announcing Elliot Friedman was live in the press box and they went to Elliot who was giving a tour of the press box and my cue was whenever Elliot points to you that's when you start with the starting lineup so I'm shitting bricks I'm you know it's a, it's my first year with the Sens it's a Stanley Cup final we're going from coast to coast to coast on CBC you know the network I grew up idolizing for sports especially uh, Saturday Night Hockey and I'm living my dream right there so I don't remember much I just I remember a lot of reverb on the announcements uh, like the starting lineup so when I go back and listen to it, especially Ray Emery, they, Ray Emery. So the, the DJ put uh, a lot of reverb on my voice. That's all I remember. All right. That's, that's a pretty awesome thing to be a part of, though, and, and to be able to go back and – sorry. The other one that sticks out of my mind has got to be Pajot's four-goal game. I awesome. Mean, that was one of the best nights that I've ever had the pleasure of announcing for a professional sports team. To, to be there in the, in the penalty box, you know, I had just come back uh, from being sick uh, from my first time and um, just, you know, announcing, especially when they tied it up, I mean, I could, the building could have blown up. I, I <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that must have been really, really cool yeah. to, to be able to be a part of it. I mean, I mean, like, I remember that game, like, I'll remember that game for the rest of my life watching it on TV. So to be there in person um, announcing it, I, I can only imagine how special it was. And um, sounds like it had a, a sentimental meaning to you, too, which is which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing you got to experience is the Olympics, I think, in 2010 and 2014, I believe, as well. Yeah. Um, so I just want to ask your whole experience of, you know, being in Sochi and how that was like an, uh, announcing the goals for, for Team Canada. You know, and it was um, mind blowing to be over there. Um, in 2010 was my first experience dealing with the Olympics. I'd never done it before. Um, 
you know, it's, I didn't realize it's, a, it's pretty much the same people that work every Olympics. Once they like you, they'll call you back for another Olympics. So after 2014, they said, are you interested in going to Pyeongchang? And I, I said, you know what? My kids really don't want me going. I, I missed a month away from them. Yes, it's a great lifetime opportunity, but I've had two Olympics, so I'm done. Um, being in Russia was, was, I was scared to go, you know, with all the, the threats in the world. But uh, especially there was a terrorist attack about a month before. So I was like, do I want to go? But I'd never been to a more secure place in my life. I mean, mm. one, one of the funniest moments going through a, one of the multiple checkpoints, I used to keep um, diaper, uh, not diaper uh, rags, but uh, wipes in my bag. So it was like this thick, kept it at the bottom of my, of my knapsack. But when it goes through the, the scanner, it looks like could be an explosive. Oh yeah. So the reason, <laughs> the reason why I kept these in my bag is I wanted hand sanitizer. So I didn't want like the, the liquid. I wanted just these wipes to put on my hand. And every single time I went through, open, quick, open. What is this? And these guys like had machine guns. You don't fuck around with them. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. All right. <laughs> I've never drank more vodka in my entire life. I mean, <laughs> And uh, my first night in Russia, I, flown, I was uh, flown 34 hours to get there. So I went Ottawa to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Moscow, Moscow to Sochi. So I get there, I land, and then my counterpart, Sergei, picks me up at the airport. And he says, okay, come with me. We're going to, uh, you're going to experience Russia the right way. <laughs> Sergei, I just want to hit the sack. I, I, I haven't slept in two days. <laughs> no, no, come to the bar. So we go to the bar. Okay, it's, I don't know, it's like three o'clock in the morning, my time, it's like whatever time there. And I go to order a, a vodka seven. So the bartender gives me the vodka and gives me a seven up. And I go to pour the seven up in my vodka and Sergey hits the seven up can, goes over the bar, <laughs> takes the ice out of my, my, my glass. I just met this guy, takes the ice out of my glass, throws it back at the bartender in a playful manner, says, in Russia, we drink vodka room temperature. What is this? this this uh, North American shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. I'm drinking straight vodka for like four hours. <laughs> it was mind blowing. Yeah, oh, you got no. the whole Russian experience, it seems. <laughs> uh, you know what I learned? Uh, the, the Russians are very proud of their culture. I mean, they'll, they speak very passionately about it. We didn't get into too much politics, but uh, I didn't have a bad experience. Uh, everywhere I went, they were friendly, and I went off the beaten path too. I didn't just stay where I was supposed to. I mean, you had you were told, you know, go here, go here, go here, but don't veer out of, out of that area. But I wanted to explore and you know uh, ex uh, see different parts, which I did. And I'm glad I did. And McDonald's, by the way, in Sochi tastes exactly the same as it does here. Wow, <laughs> fun <Awesome>. fact. <laughs> I um, one of my well, good family friends worked. Uh, worked Sochi Olympics as well. Um, and he was saying it was really cool because like he watched the um, team, team Canada, like the women's team Canada win gold um, while they're sitting at the beach because Sochi is just right on the sea. Right. And you're able to just kind of like, he was like, it was, it was a warm day. Like we're in shorts outside. People are playing volleyball. And then at the same time, they there's the winter Olympics going on and people are skiing in the mountains like um, an hour away. So yeah. yeah, it sounds like a pretty. It, it sounds like a pretty, pretty awesome part of Russia to get to experience. So, it was cool. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll uh, get into my next question for you. So, um, I guess like obviously there's uh, no. It's no secret that um, tension from the rebuild uh, lately has caused a lot of animosity from fans over the past few years. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, just a lot of people kind of losing faith in the Senators, I think, and maybe questioning um, certain decisions that they've made. Um, and I guess I was just curious, in your own opinion, if you feel there's been a significant increase in fan interest um, since the future in Ottawa has begun to look a little more brighter. So um, I guess, like, my question is, do you feel that um, the fans or like the community is kind of gathering the same way that you would have seen previously when you were working um, in, in 2005 to, or 2006 um, and so on in those late thousand years when we had a really, really strong fan base and um, something that it looks like we've unfortunately kind of gotten away from until maybe um, now and moving forward? Well, you know, having watched, I'm, I'm 46 years old and, and uh, having watched the fan base for the last, you know, 20 some odd years, 
I get the frustration from the fan base. I total, I, I've seen this before. And I mean, guys like Dean and Brown could certainly expand on this much more than I could because they've seen it all. But I see the angst on Twitter. I, I get it. I, you know, I, I understand it fully. Um, I have a lot of faith in Pierre Dorian. The reason why is because he watches much more hockey than we do. Okay. Yeah. He's paid to watch hockey. It's not just, you know, we're all fans. We all, all the bloggers, all the podcasters, it's, it's their right to criticize. I get it. But sometimes you got to trust a guy like Pierre Dorian, you know, I, For sure. you know, see all the, the ribbing on Twitter and that's fine, but that's part of the job. But, you know, every general manager in every sport uh, gets ribbed constantly. And I remember Brian Murray making decisions and even Marshall Johnson and, um, Oh God, Muckler before the late John Muckler before that making decisions that the fans would call into T- Team 1200 when I was there. Oh God, I can't believe Murray made that trade. The guy's an arsehole. Why would he make a trade like that? Yeah, yeah. And you know now the fans that are coming back, you know, are are in their late twenties, early thirties that were young when the se- when the team started, and they're like, "Where's my team?" You got to understand, you know, teams like uh, Pittsburgh and chicago were terrible uh, before they got their guys so yeah. we're I, I fully believe in the rebuild i love watching the young guys i mean you know how, how, you know st- everyone got mad when the sends picked brady kachuk uh, no they should have gone with the, uh, the, the that other guy yeah brady kachuk, a star in this league so is thomas shabbat so is tim stutzel you know i was sitting there watching the draft just like everybody else and like who are they gonna pick you know we're gonna get this guy this is why you trust a guy like Pierre Dorian. Yeah. That, well said. My, now, well, well said, said I, sure. I think a lot of people, you know, they, it, it sort of comes back to that. Um, I, I've seen a lot of people just admit that they're playing uh, just just wrong. I mean, the people that that complain about the Brady Kachuk pick are, are here now, you know, on their knees and and you know. I was wrong. I was I was folded Zadina you know, all the way, and boy, Me boy, too. was I wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it is fine. what it is. That's fandom. That's fine to be wrong. I mean, you know, the thing about sports that I love is that you're watching, you have an emotional investment. So a lot of times when you have an emotional investment, you say dumb shit. As I have said, dumb shit about the New England Patriots on a number of <laughs> Like when he started throwing to Edelman a couple of years ago, I'm like, forget Edelman. There's like other guys. Like, what are you doing, Tom? <laughs> yeah. Okay, stupid. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I can pay it off. Uh, yeah, yeah. And no, I, I completely agree. And I, th- I think that that's kind of the nice thing too, though, is about like kind of seeing the fruition now of these kids coming in and really developing. And it's like all those people that were so pissed off for, for Carlson being traded away and things like that. It's like, okay, like now, now you're kind of starting to see the bigger plan. And um, I mean, I, I, for one, like, yeah, I mean, I was cursing Dorian's name when Carlson got traded, but now I'm looking at that return and would do it again in a heartbeat. Right. So um, it's just crazy how age can, or how years can, can ha- uh, heal things like that. I wasn't happy when Boro left, but you know, I, I, I looked at it from, you know, the sense point of view and like, did they want to, he, he got two years right in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe the Sens were only looking at a year. I love Boro. I, I love the guy. You know, he's salt to the earth kind of guy. But maybe the Sens didn't have a, him in his plans because we're stock full of uh, picks. You know, especially in Belleville. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, things happen and and things come into play. But obviously, we are trending towards becoming a good team in the next yeah. few years. And one of those key pieces is obviously Tim Stutzla. So I was just going to ask you a fun question: Would you ever consider? coming out of retirement just to announce uh, uh, scored by number 18, Tim Stutzla. Uh, is that something that tempts you uh, to, to want to say one day? Well, my son keeps asking me, he's like, can you just go back for one more game? I'm like, no. <laughs> just one. <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't turn down the opportunity to announce the Tim Stutzla goal, but that's up for the Sands and Jonathan Trotje to uh, let me do that. I passed the torch on to Trotje. It's his now, so I'll watch from, from a fan's point of view. Can we can we hear uh, your audition? <laughs> Number eighteen in the middle is with Tim Stutzel. Oh. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> yeah. I think that's deserving. I was like, go long in the stoop. 
<laughs> that's wow. I don't know how you're not gasping for air after that one. That's incredible. I did Bobby Ryan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of practice. Yeah, so I guess that's deserving, and we'll we'll try to make it trending on on uh, Twitter to maybe hopefully get you back for one game. That would be pretty awesome. But uh, so yeah, so this is another cool question. I mostly just a comment, but I did some research, and you actually I, I found out it, in 2017 purchased the Nissan 350Z. Uh, you nicknamed it uh, the MLCC car. I think it's midlife crisis car. Uh, <laughs> but most recently, you posted a picture of a nice Mustang. So have you always been a, a fan of cars? And if so, it, it, what's your dream car? I've always been, to answer your question, yes, I've always been a fan of cars. So in 2017, um, I was looking at getting a sports car. And my wife's like, initially, I wanted a Harley. My wife's like, not a friggin' chance, not getting one of those. I'm like, can I get a sports car? She's like, yeah, knock yourself out. So I had a buddy of mine <laughs> who broke up with his girlfriend, and they were selling her 2006 uh, Nissan 370 uh, G. Oh. So I'm like, I'll buy it. <laughs> I love that car. I loved it, loved it, loved it. Now, after I beat cancer, I was hanging around a dealership in Bell's Corners, and I was walking by this Infiniti a GS, whatever it was, uh, convertible that had four seats. And I'm like, my 370 only has two seats, so I'm going to get this one. It's got four <laughs> seats. So I can take the whole family out for ice cream. I got two kids. <laughs> so I brought the car home, and my wife's like, what the hell is that? I said, that's my... <sighs> like, no. I said, that's my fuck you cancer car. She's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyways, in 2017, I was driving by, uh, I was in my my black Infinity uh, with my son, and we drove by the local dealership, which is Dan Murphy Ford, which is now Barhaven Ford, and we just, you know, pulled in to look at cars, because he loves, he loves cars too, and I saw a bunch of Mustangs out front, and one of their sales guys came out and said, hey, you looking at Mustang? I was like, no, 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 I'm just kicking tires here, just for my son. He's like, what do you want for yours? So I gave him a high number, just get rid of him. Comes back two minutes later. He's like, I can do that for you. I'm like, you can? I'm like, he goes, yeah, and this Mustang is like 0% financing. It could be yours for this. I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I came home an hour later with a, with a slip like this. And my son runs in. He goes, Dad, daddy bought a car. My wife's like, what the hell did you do? I was like, here's the uh, sales sheet. I bought a Mustang um, I, in two days. She's like, I thought we said no more cars. I said, yeah, but that was a uh, cancer car. It's like, that's enough. So if I buy another car, she's going to cut this off. <laughs> so uh, my dream car is definitely a Ferrari. I've always loved Ferraris, but, you know, you can't drive a Ferrari every day. I drive the Mustang pretty much uh, every day in the summer as long as it, as, as it doesn't rain. That's, mm. I don't take it out when it rains because it's real, real, real drive. And I have like racing tires. So the car slides all over the road. So when it rains, the car's inside. But I love cars, you know, and I always wanted a, a, a toy, a midlife crisis edition. That's what it's midlife crisis cancer car. I love that. Uh, I think that's, you know, very motivating too, to just live your life and do what you want. And uh, I, I love that. And I, I think that a, a lot of what you do is, is there's a lot of positives and I, I love to see how positive you are and how, how you approach life online. I, I mean, I think it's a big motivation for a lot of people. And I just want to thank you for, for, for being that great uh, influence in our community. I really do want to thank you. Well, I, all the credit goes to my wife. She's the one that controls, uh, you know, my mood swings and says, you can't tweet that you'll get in a lot of shit. So don't <laughs> do that don't do this facebook post but you know she she uh, reels in the uh, the reins when she's got to oh awesome, awesome. Stu. you uh and and just to reiterate what, what nick said you're truly an inspiration um what you've done professionally what you've done personally um if there's any life advice that you could give to to some some young people some of our young listeners what what might it be uh life is short don't take things too seriously and um listen a lot listen to people it's okay to disagree with somebody, but hear their point of view. And uh, if you're going to argue, make sure that you're arguing from a place of strength, not just something you saw on the internet. I like that. 
Thank you so much, Stu. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, we wish you all the best. Enjoy the season. And um, yeah, too, th thanks again. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care.